Hi, I'm Joey Deanna, and I am a colorist and online editor based out of the DC area. So this is kind of my main Omniscope layout that I use basically almost all the time when I'm grading. I wanted to set up a layout that I didn't have to manage actively very much. So I've got a lot of different scopes going on at the same time, uh, which, again, that's where some of that uh, performance gets really helpful because I can run multiple scopes, even with UHD resolution inputs, no problem. Uh, I keep my scopes on a kind of small ultra wide monitor right below my reference monitor, because that lets me have kind of a direct eye line. I'm not ever constantly turning my head back and forth to look at the scopes versus look at the picture. I can almost see them both at the same time as I'm adjusting things, which is really not just useful, but also comfortable. Because, you know, I'm here doing this for a thousand shots at a time, uh, eight, nine, ten hours a day, sometimes more. You know, having something ergonomically comfortable matters a lot. Like I said, this is my current Omniscope layout. On the top, I've got an RGB parade. So the luminance levels of red, green, and blue compared to each other. Then I have a luminance only waveform. So that's going to show me the overall contrast of my image. Then I have the timeline view, which is an Omniscope specific feature that I am in love with. It's kind of the best implementation for looking at changes over time that I've ever seen in a scope package. Then on the bottom, I've got my vector scopes, which show me color information, how much of every color is in the scene, uh, irrespective of the contrast that we see in the waveform monitors, which uh, I've got split into four views, basically the shadows, midtones, and highlights on the left. And you might notice those are actually kind of by default zoomed in. I have them set to be zoomed in so I can see where my highlights are or my shadows are, if they have any color tint in them uh, in great detail. And then in the middle, I've got my main vector scope, which is showing the entire luminance range of the image and the way the colors are distributed. Then I have a histogram, which is essentially showing the distribution of brightness in red, green, blue, and Luma channels across the image. So right now you can see this is a pretty dark image, so most of the histogram is over to the left. But if I grade the image up or down, you can see that histogram interacts with it. And if I adjust the color balance, you can see, okay, now there's less blue, now there's more blue, and you can kind of see how the color channels overlay on top of each other. And then to the right of that, I've got some QC tools, basically the blanking detection, which I do a lot of documentary work that has a lot of footage from various sources. And one of the biggest problems we have is something called blanking, where if something isn't sized exactly right, you might see a black border. Networks hate that, and that will fail QC every time. But when you're focusing on color, you don't always see it. So if I just move my image over a little bit, you can see it's immediately showing me with a big red bar, I've got a blanking error. And that's also where the timeline comes into play because as I jump through my timeline and hit play, look, it's going to show me that I've got a blanking error for that shot. Then when I cut to another shot, it's going to show me that I don't have a blanking error there. And look, as I jump around my timeline, Basically, anytime I hit play or anytime I move the playhead, Omniscope is going to read the time code from the SDI output and show me in real time my average levels, my peak levels, if I had audio on here, an audio waveform, and kind of a thumbnail, and if I've got blanking or gamut errors. So it's one of those things that I can just kind of look at it in the corner of my eye, and if I see that red warning come up, I know, hey, I need to look at blanking for this shot, right? Uh, it, it makes kind of preventing those errors really, really uh, easy, which is nice. And one thing that was kind of unexpected when I started using the timeline, you know, you can see they, they label it as HDR because it's actually giving you HDR values for the frame average light level and the maximum light level, which is essentially just an average of how bright the image is, right? That's useful to me in SDR as well, because one of the things that we deal with a lot is, you know, if the brightness changes over a shot dramatically. You know, you will go in and keyframe that. Like if an iris opens up or closes up, you know, we'll kind of keyframe that to smooth it out. 
when you play down a shot in that timeline, you can see that line kind of come up and down with the overall exposure of the shot, which makes figuring out where to keyframe iris bumps really, really easy, which is, is that was, I, I didn't even think of that when I first started using the timeline, but the first time I did it, I was like, oh, well, I never want to do this without that. A couple other things about the layout that have evolved over time is you'll notice my overall scopes, my master vector scope and my luminance waveform. I keep those dead center because that's where your eye goes first. I found I used to have the parade split where the luminance was on the left and the RGB was on the right, which effectively made it a little bit in the middle. And I kept finding myself accidentally looking at the red channel and thinking it was overall luminance. Uh, so I kind of rearrange those. So my default eye line, and this is just kind of me personally, but where I have the monitor, my default eye line, if I look at the luminance scope, is like the first place I look. So when I'm kind of adjusting the contrast of a shot, that's the first thing I see. And then if I want to look for color balance, I can look at the parades or the vector scopes as well. But my first first reaction when I look at this scope is overall vector scope, overall luminance scope, which is just it's quick, it's fast, and that's what matters most when you're going through a thousand shots in a day. And I'm also a big, big believer in physical control surfaces. Uh, we've always used color panels to kind of be able to interactively adjust our image and adjust multiple properties at one time and really get an intuitive feel of how we're grading. And a big part of the efficiency in our day to day work comes from muscle memory, right? I don't have to look down and figure out what keys I'm hitting and what shortcuts or drag a mouse or something like that. I can just, oh, I need to adjust the shadows. Here, let's push the shadows a little bit more red. I can adjust them up and down. I don't need to be looking at this panel at all. I can feel where everything is. So I use Stream Decks, which are configurable button panels, to kind of expand that functionality, stuff that isn't on this panel. Uh, I control with a Stream Deck. And one of the cool things about Omniscope is it has a really, really advanced Stream Deck integration built into it. So I can control Omniscope completely with a Stream Deck on my desk, which means I never have to reach over to my assist station that's running the software and, you know, drag a mouse around to interact with it. When I'm grading, I want to be, you know, hands down on the grading surface, looking at my monitor, looking at my scopes. I don't want to be mousing around if I can avoid it at all. So I have... Uh, you know, a set of Stream Deck buttons always dedicated to Omniscope. Uh, I have one to zoom into the shadows. So if I want to really look at the details of the way my shadows are balanced, I can just press that button and I can zoom in at three different levels on my RGB parade. The reason I do that on the RGB parade is it gives me a great view into the balance of my shadows but I still have my Luma Parade, or sorry, I still have my Luma waveform available at full size to see it also in the context of the image. So I can zoom in to my shadows at three different levels. I also have zoom into the whites at three different levels. So I can very clearly see here that my highlights are very biased towards red. I've got these big red peaks that are those neon lights in the image. I can see that clearly just by zooming in, whereas when I'm zoomed out, you can see it a little bit, but you don't really see all the detail. I mentioned earlier that I keep my HML uh, vector scopes zoomed in all the time. That's because I like having a bigger view, especially since they're split out into three things. Well, sometimes I want to have a bigger view in the main vector scope as well. So I have a zoom vector scope button that I can just toggle on and off. I like having the main vector scope be at one-to-one -one scale most of the time but if i'm really trying to balance two shots or match two shots i can just instantly press one button zoom in similarly i jump between sdr and hdr a lot i'm used to an 8-bit scale so 0 to 255 levels uh or 16 to 235 in legal range but when i'm grading in hdr it's an absolute scale of 0 to 10,000 nits so i just have buttons to switch all of my scales from 8-bit scales to a PQ nit scale. So I don't ever have to go into the preferences or the menus. If I jump into an HDR project, I just hit that one button on the Stream Deck and I'm ready to go. Then I've got solo keys, so I can 
solo that luminance waveform, see it really big, get, you know, kind of a more detailed view of my contrast. Same thing with my RGB parade. Same thing with my vector scope and my HML vector scope. Now, one thing you may notice that's different in my setup here than a lot of scope setups that I've seen is I don't like to do the colorization of scopes where like the red is red, the green is green, the blue is blue. That's because I want all my color perception to be focused on the grading monitor. I don't want other colors pulling into my vision unless it's something dramatic like that big red blanking error. Then, yeah, I want that to kind of interrupt my flow and say, hey, you got a problem, right? But I don't want a bunch of color in my scopes when I need to focus on color on the reference monitor. And one of the things, like I said, with the grading panel and all these physical controls, muscle memory is, is so important for efficiency. That's why I do try to keep one layout. If I have a very specific need for a project, I'll go in and make a different layout and use that for that project. But I've become so comfortable with this layout like I said, my eye just falls to where it needs to go without me having to think about it. And that's, that's really important to me because it makes me more efficient. One of the absolute coolest things about Omniscope is that Tom and the development team are incredibly responsive to user feedback. Uh, like I said, I was very early in beta testing and I've had plenty of features added into the software. I'm always on the beta version. So every so often we do find bugs and I can give Tom a bug report and he can have a fixed build sometimes within the hour. Like the, 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 the efficiency of development and the pace at which this software is just, you know, it's, it's very good. It just keeps finding ways to get better and it keeps getting better really, really fast. It's incredible. Incredible. And that's besides just getting kind of new tools, bug fixes, everything really quickly, getting, you know, my feedback listened to and features that I need added in. It's also just really fun to see the software evolve and when things get added, be able to integrate them into the workflow. Like I said, the timeline kind of came out of nowhere for me and now it's essential, right? I, I, I think it works. I, I always have it up there. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, you if you buy a set of hardware scopes, they're the same forever. Uh, if you get into the Omniscope ecosystem, yes, it's amazing now. It only gets better over time, which has been it just absolutely not just feature-wise great. Like I said, it's just fun to have the software evolve and have new things come in constantly and have the developers be available uh, for their users, which is not the case with, with every product that I use. So it's, I mean, it's absolutely exceptional in that regard. 